Hello and welcome to another episode of Wannabe Entrepreneur. Today I have another interview for you. Today with me I have uh, Abdul Musan. Uh, hey Abdul Musan, everything good? All is well, Razal, all is well. Excited to be here. Yes, uh, hopefully I, I, say, I spelled it or I said your name correctly. Is it how you say it or how do you say it actually? Yeah, that's actually close. Yeah, uh, Abdul Musan. Abdul Musan. Okay, cool. Yeah, so the way I, I found you, so I, I'm always on on Reddit and on Twitter trying to find other entrepreneurs for me to interview. And uh, you actually got mentioned by indie makers on, on Twitter. And I thought, okay, this is cool. Let, let me check. And then, then I, I saw that you were also uh, an entrepreneur building your company. Your company is called OneBase. And you'll talk about, about it in, in a minute. But it's, it's super cool design product it's kind of a side table that you can add uh, to your uh, or not attached but you can put it in the side of the couches or uh, or any seat and it's very practical for you know food and to keep your cell phone so it's super nice product and i thought okay let's uh, let's uh, speak and uh, let's learn more about this journey and um, yeah so thank you so much for uh, for accepting this invitation Thank you. I appreciate it. Looking forward to chatting. I would like to ask if you could introduce yourself to the listeners. Absolutely. So my name is uh, Abdel Mehsin. I'm uh, based in uh, Kuwait. I'm from Kuwait. Um, I'm actually a full-time uh, engineer. So my background is in engineering, mechanical engineering. Mm. Um, and I've recently started this project called One Base on the side. Uh, and so currently I'm juggling both at the same time. And uh, when did you start the project? So the idea for the project uh, came by about four years ago. Um, it was a scratch your own itch type of uh, type of problem where I realized that, you know, I needed something uh, for for my living room that was missing, uh, and I wanted to design for it. Uh, four years later, we just started selling uh, about six months ago. So yeah, so tell me a little bit more about your. Uh your like entrepreneurial background so you study in engineering it's like is this your first entrepreneurial project did you ever like growing up you know at other entrepreneurial projects uh, or or maybe family that are also entrepreneurs how is that like so so this is actually i'd say my third project uh, right now third or, or or second am i adding one <laughs> but basically <laughs> so so i graduated from i studied in the u.s Uh, and I graduated mm -hmm. uh, in 2012. And uh, right about that time when I came back uh, to Kuwait, uh, you know, I got uh, I got that typical, you know, day job, followed that uh, uh, tried and true route. Uh, but then I started noticing that everyone around me was uh, was launching their own businesses, growing their own businesses. Uh, and that that idea kind of interested me, like, okay, why, why not have uh, a side business for myself? And so when I started exploring the uh, different possibilities, uh, somehow, some way, my research landed on um, a laundry business. Uh, okay. So this was around, let's say, end of 2013 is when we started that uh, that business. Uh, so the setup was like a traditional uh, laundry business, but then the customer experience, the way we provided the service uh, was a bit different. Uh, so what we did was we charged people a flat rate. So we were the first in Kuwait to provide a flat rate laundry service, subscription-based, uh, everything was scheduled and we'd pass by on a weekly basis wash ah, fold cool. and return and return clothes yeah it was very interesting lots of lessons learned mm -hmm. uh, but yeah so th that started uh, end of 2013 uh, fast forward four years later around 2017 is when we decided you know we wanted to move on from uh, from that business so yeah. my partner and i eventually sold out the business um and and yeah and so so that was my first let's say experience Uh, with being in a market, interacting with customers, building a project, trying to grow uh, a business. You said that in, in Kuwait, a lot of people were also entrepreneurs starting their own business. So describe me a little bit what's the, you know, the startup scenario in Kuwait. So back then in, in uh, 2012, 2013, uh, that was right around when we had a boom in both, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, CrossFit based businesses. So uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the typical route was a lot of, uh, you know, this cro these CrossFit boxes, gym boxes were, uh, were starting to open up. Uh, but also it was the, the beginning of the specialty coffee boom. Uh, and I think this was also mm -hmm. global at, at, uh, at the time. Yeah. So 
most entrepreneurs in Kuwait were going one of either route. Um, and, and I'm generalizing here. This is, this is, this is not uh, everybody for, uh, for sure. Uh, but today it's a much more mature market. You know, people are more aware of the possibilities and myself yeah. included, right? Uh, because at the time, you know, when I started my own business, uh, the laundry startup, uh, I didn't think that there were so many possibilities. My thinking was you had to have like a physical shop. You had to have, you know, employees working for you, you know, right. the, the traditional sense. Um, but fast forward to today, you know, you have entrepreneurs uh, working in completely different uh, on completely different projects. Um, you know, you have your uh, app builders, you have your, uh, uh, you know, software engineers, you have your content creators, you know, people creating yeah. content as a business uh, and all sorts of things. Even e-commerce, uh, uh, you know, a lot, lot of people have started e-commerce based businesses. So it's definitely a more mature market uh, today than it was, you know, what, 10, uh, 9, 10 years ago. Yeah, I guess, I guess this trend of uh, entrepreneurship is growing everywhere. Even even in Portugal, I, I feel like when I when I left Portugal because I left six years ago and it was also you know entrepreneurship starting and and now for instance there's the web submit there and there's like a big boom with startups. They people even call it the I guess the California of uh, of Europe sometimes. So it's uh, <laughs> it, it's funny to okay. see that how how this trend is growing. So, but you studied in in the U.S. Uh, was it your plan always to return home, or uh, how did that go? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, f uh, when I was there, uh, maybe I'd say second year of, of uh, college, uh, yeah. I did consider, or you know, I had in my mind that I might continue uh, doing my masters and then PhD. So going the um, academic way, you know, yeah. Educa academic way, yeah. Uh, but then, but then that kind of like faded away, uh, <laughs> and and I decided that I definitely did want to come back to Kuwait once I'm done with my bachelor's. Yeah. What What was the biggest culture difference, or like the biggest, you know, cultural shock that you found when you went to the U.S.? Is it very different or not? Uh, it's an interesting question. So. Uh, I think the the major difference is that uh, you know the culture here in Kuwait is more family oriented. Um, mm -hmm. So so a lot of gatherings, a lot of you know uh, weekend activities uh, are done with family. Uh, whereas you know when I when I was in the states, you know I have I had many friends over there that would you know visit their their family once every month or visit their family yeah. on you know, thanksgiving for example or something like that <laughs> and it's nothing against them but i found i found that kind of uh weird maybe because it's different than what i'm used to yeah. um but yeah definitely the the you know it, it's more centered around family here in kuwait for sure it's funny yeah i, I felt the same actually when i came to to germany because well, it also depends on the families in Portugal, but the families, yeah, with weekends, we would, you know, go for the lunch with the family or, or dinner. And, uh, you know, I would call my family every, almost every day <laughs> here. Also because it's what they expected, you know? Yep. And then I, I was speaking with my, with a couple of friends here from, uh, and I met friends from all over the world, but especially Germans. And exactly what you say, they don't speak that often with, uh, with their families. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That that difference is is prevalent. I think I think it has to do with like the you know specific countries. I think the way they're they're built, the way they're set up, the cultural aspect of it, is it's more family oriented than than other countries. Yeah, yeah. And you miss that. You miss that when uh, when you're in the in the US. I mean, most definitely. You know, when 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 you're first, you know, when you first go to university, you're like, okay, I want to live this independent life. You know, and you're like, and you're 18 years old, 19 years old. You you want yeah. that. You know, you want to go away. You want to be independent. You want to do things your way uh, by yourself. Uh, you know, meet new people, meet different people, um, and so the the excitement of it definitely attracts you. Uh, and it's and it's a main reason for why many people decide to you know study abroad. Uh, but then with time, you know everything has pros and cons. But it's yeah. what your it's what you're used to. It's what you your preference is. Um, and so for me personally, I'm I'm definitely I definitely believe that I'm a I'm a family person. <laughs> and and uh, where in the US did you study? So I studied at uh, the Ohio State University, uh, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, I've never been to the US. I'm, uh, it, I guess it's also a place where, you know, the whole startup scenario, especially the tech startup, started, I would say. Did you get some inspiration mm. from there or not so much? 
Uh, not so much, to be honest. I mean, at the time, I never thought I, you know, I never had this in me that, you know, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. This mm-hmm. all started when I came back, uh, you know, when I finished my studies. At, at the time when I was there, you know, all I was thinking was, you know, study and then in free time, go play football. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I would do over there, but uh, never considered like starting a business while studying or anything like that. And football, you mean soccer or football, like American football? No, yeah, soccer, soccer. Is it a big sport also in Kuwait? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the primary sport in Kuwait is, is uh, football, definitely. Oh, really? Yeah. There's a lot of similarities yeah. to Portugal then. <laughs> That's definitely also our, <laughs> our primary sport. T- then you return to Kuwait. Why did you add this, you know, this urge to start your own thing? Why not just, you know, in, work uh, for a nice company and then play soccer why, why did you want to start something? <laughs> um, you know, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I think definitely like I don't want to I don't want to call it social pressure, but definitely you know realizing the people around me and what everyone is doing, uh, and the opportunities that are out there, uh, definitely like appealed to me. Uh, you know, my 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 very close. Uh, like a group of friends, like very, very cl- close group of friends uh, don't have businesses, actually. So it wasn't like uh, any like s- social pressure or that I wanted to be like, you know, my friends that had businesses. But then, you know, friends of friends and, you know, uh, the general like, uh, you know, people of my age at the time, mm-hmm. they were definitely starting businesses. Um, and that kind of uh, appealed to me. At the time, I was, uh, I used to read a lot. So I was an avid reader yeah. at the time. Um and, and right about when I started my uh, my day job, uh, I read a, an interesting book by a guy called uh, MJ DeMarco. It's called mm-hmm. The Millionaire Fast Lane, and and, okay. and the title is a bit cheesy. <laughs> I, I get it, but but the actual book is, uh, is 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 a really really powerful book. Um, and and you know, for anyone that's uh, that's in, that's interested to understand, you know, the possibility of. Uh, starting your own thing that's definitely so, uh, a book uh, a book to read ignore the cheesy the cheesy title <laughs> but uh, it, it was it, it was definitely a book that you know uh piqued my interest uh it raised the, the level of awareness for me like oh wow okay i can i can do something besides you know having a, a day job going to work yeah. every day i can do something on the side but what what is the rewards is the reward money? Is the reward being your own boss? Like, what is your, uh, what are you looking for? Yeah, that's that's a. You're asking all the tough questions. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> that's my but, job. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, yeah, so so I mean, yeah. Initially, you're like, you know, I want to go. I want to, you know, what's called rage against the machine. Like, I don't want to. I don't want to be part of like big corporate, uh, uh, big corporate organization. I want to yeah, be my yeah, own, yeah. Uh, my own boss. I want to lead my own business. And that's that definitely has an appeal to it. Uh, but with time, I've come to understand and and like realize that you know, it, it's more of I want financial independence i want the possibility of you know leaving if i wanted to leave so yeah. the way i see it right now is it's it's not binary it's not you know quit your day job start a business or quit your day job go full on on your dream you know it's not one yeah. or the other there are definitely and this is again part of me like uh, exploring more being more aware and, and that you know you can definitely start grow and 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 build uh, you know, dare I say, million dollar businesses while keeping your day job. Wow, so okay. it, it, yeah. it, it's it's more of it's more of you know, um, I, I, I guess something that you want to be part of 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 reality that isn't right now, and you want to bring it to life. Um, yeah. That that kind of thing, and it just so happens that you know you you make some some decent amount of uh, of money, and then you gain that that financial independence. You know, mm-hmm. you don't you don't know where you'll be in five years from now. You don't know where you'll be ten years from now, and so you know, just having that uh, possibility yeah. is 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 definitely a, a something. I, I totally agree, and uh, that's definitely something that also excites me about this this lifestyle, entrepreneurial lifestyle, because I don't want to be slave of my work, right? And uh, you know, especially in Portugal, where people don't make that much money. Uh, in Germany, it's different, but in Portugal, it's less money that you get. At if you get a loan, if you get family, at some point you need to work. It's like it's not an option to stop. Imagine you don't like your job. Imagine that you want to whatever travel. You can't do that because you need to work. You know, you have responsibilities. And uh, this financial independence that you mentioned, it's definitely something, you know, that 
everyone desires and uh, I think entrepreneurship is definitely a great way to get there mm-hmm. but it's it's a very tough journey and uh, let, let's get in, in, into that journey then for uh, for one base so you like how did this idea came to you okay so so uh, right about four to five years ago is when uh, when I got married and and in Kuwait mm-hmm. the cultural norm is you live with your parents until you're married and then you when you once you get married like you, you get your own apartment um, right. so that's right around when I got married and so I moved in into my uh, my own apartment uh, and you know when you're moving into a, a, a different space uh, and definitely the, uh, my apartment compared to like Uh, uh, the house I used to live in with the, with my parents is definitely a smaller space, uh, mm. and and so everything that's around you is is more considered in terms of you know its usefulness, its utility, uh, but also like its its purpose. Like, do you really need this? And so you know what, what, when I when I moved in into my tiny apartment, I I furnished everything from you know IKEA, the the usual yeah. stuff, right? So you go out, you get your couch, you get your dining table, you get your your coffee table, and things like that. Now, with time, I started noticing, you know, how I used to use different pieces of furniture uh, in, in my apartment. And so what I noticed was at the time, we used to watch a lot of Netflix, for example, my wife and I. Um, whenever I wanted to work, like I'd have the laptop on my lap, sit uh, in my living room on my on my couch. Uh, mm-hmm. If I wanted to watch TV, I'm, I'm in that living room. You know, pretty much everything that, you know, happens in my apartment happens in the in the, the living room. In, in the yeah. living room right um, and so what I started noticing was okay when, when I have to watch uh, Netflix for example maybe I'm ordering some takeout and 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 I have to like use the coffee table and now I have to sit on the floor and you know use the coffee table as like a as like a dining table um, yeah. but also other things like working from from your uh, from your uh, you know the, the comfort of, of your couch you have your own your own laptop on your lap and, and and things like that and so the idea came to me is like why isn't there a you know a, a simple piece of furniture that's like a like a table but that comes close to you that perhaps has like a removable tray for for food or or even to use as like a laptop tray for example um and 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 maybe sometimes you want to like uh watch something on your iPad on your on your phone things like that and and so that's what inspired you know me to start looking for a solution for for something like right. that uh it's not, it's definitely not like a you know a life threatening problem that i wanted to solve it's more of like you know this thing is nice to have like why doesn't this thing yeah. exist right yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and so when i went out you know to see what was available in the market i found you know your typical c tables and so c tables are like small uh Uh, side tables uh, mm-hmm. and by their design they can come close to your couch because they're designed as a C right mm-hmm. and so I actually went out and I, and I got one from uh, from IKEA C table and I used it for a while and after using it for a while I realized that this was definitely an upgrade but there were still some things that I wanted to add to this to this table so I wanted to add the functionality of a tray I wanted to add the functionality of you know a stand for for an iPad or a, or, or a phone Um, and what I also noticed, for example, is, you know, I have my Apple TV remote, I have my, my TV remote, and it's all, it was always lying around the, uh, the apartment. So these tiny little habits I became aware of, and I decided, mm-hmm. you know, why, why don't we design a, an upgraded version of this C table? Of the C-table. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so that, that's when, you know, I started on my journey with, uh, with OneBase. And, and, and the idea was always with, with, with one base. The idea was always, you know, how can we create something that, uh, works around our, you know, 21st century habits, daily habits, but act also looked good. So in the market, you can find some, some really nifty tables that were, are made of plastic and they, you know, they have the slot for a, for a phone. They have the removable tray and all of that. But, but the, the downside to them is they're, You know, they look cheap. They're made from plastic, mm-hmm. and and, yeah. and and so the challenge is, you know, once I'm done, I want to put this thing away because I want I don't want to see it. It looks ugly. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. functional, but it looks ugly, and so that's when you know we we sort of understood the the opportunity in in the market is like, okay, how can we create something that was functional around our uh, uh, habits, but that also had a purpose when not being in use. Plus, yeah. it's nice to look at. So you don't want to be putting this thing away. Um, and yeah. is it, is it, um, did you like, 
ask your friends if they had the same problem as you? Or uh, did you try to somehow validate and ask around if if people would have the same issues or uh, or not? You just went for it. Yeah, so it, it was definitely not like methodical research. It's, it wasn't like, okay, I'm mm -hmm. going to interview specific people and things like that. It was more of like gauging and testing, uh, not testing, but like gauging the the uh, the uh, customers in the market. And so definitely I went to people like myself that lived in, in you know, similar sized apartments and things like that and asked them, you know, uh, how do you go about you know using your coffee table uh when you want to have uh, when you want to have dinner do you do you do, do you move to a dining table or do you you know try to have your your meal in front of uh, in front of tv if you yeah. want it to work do you work do you have like a dedicated office at home or do you work from your from your living room and and so those were the sorts of things that you know gave me a bit of indication that yeah maybe there's there's uh, an opportunity here yeah Yeah, it's funny because now that I th what you just said, I can totally subscribe to that. So, yeah, my life is is my living room, and I mostly work from the couch. And uh, so it's funny how I guess this changed a little bit with time. Because if I think on my parents, and when I used to live with my parents, like eating food, we had like a specific dining table for it. Like you eat in the dining table. It's funny how to see like how you know, families kind of are changing more towards yeah. the couch and, you know, where Netflix is running and <laughs> and all of this. <laughs> yeah, so. definitely. I mean, we definitely don't want to be promoting, you know, bad habits. But at the same time, you know, my thing is I want to look at furniture from a critical eye. I want to look at furniture, like how can furniture be designed in a way to accommodate my, my, my actual habits? So it's mm -hmm. less about, you know, here's a couch with with four legs it's less about you know here's a here's a coffee table with four legs and it's just a plank of wood on top like okay yeah. it's nice but i i need i need to be you know efficient with the with the space yeah, because it needs you to know, be practical yeah yeah and, and so it definitely needs to have this sort of utility to it so you kind of ask your friends and uh, you saw that they had the same problem and you thought okay maybe this is something that we can build What what were your next steps? Did you like? Did you start making a design, and what did you do? Uh, I definitely didn't know anybody that was around me uh, that made physical products, so there wasn't anyone that I felt you know I could go and ask like, how do I yeah. go about doing this, right? Uh, and so that's partly why it took me four years from idea to actually selling uh, mm -hmm. to, to customers. It's because I didn't know what the next steps were, and at each point. You know, uh, I, I I turned back again and I was like, okay, what do I do now? Uh, so everything I've learned, I've learned firsthand. Um, and so when when I had that idea and I started talking to some of some of my friends, some of the people that I felt were part of the target market, um, I thought, okay, I needed to reach to someone that's a, that's an industrial designer. You know that that I can go to and explain the the usability that i'm looking for or the problem that i'm trying to solve and they in turn can translate those problems into like here's here's a, an actual like design right mm -hmm. um and and i'm definitely not an industrial designer so i knew that i had to go to someone um and so just like everything when you get stuck i went to google <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so and so i googled like Okay, uh, industrial design. I, I I can't remember the exact keywords that I that I typed in, but they were along those lines. Uh, yeah. And so I found an industrial designer. We worked for uh, for a bit, and and that industrial de designer came up with a, with a design, uh, and it was it was a good design, but it wasn't a design that suited you know the the vision that we had for the product in the sense that i wanted to mass produce this product i didn't want to create you know five or ten pieces of this product yes. i, I mm -hmm. wanted to mass manufacture it and to sell to sell you know quantities of this yeah um, ikea style ikea style exactly and so what that meant was you know the the, the design needed to be flat packed right um yeah. and 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 that's not so as simple as you know take a design that's you know rigid And and you know flat pack it. No, the the way you design it uh, and the stru uh, structural stability of the entire design needs to be done with flat packing in mind. So from the moment mm. you start designing, you're thinking, okay, this needs to be you yeah. know made into different parts um, so that it can right. be flat packed. 
And so that's why the, the initial design did not work or we did not implement it, let's say. Were you paying then the, this industrial design, designer from your yes. own pocket? Yes. Okay. So, so the entire project, you know, up to today is uh, purely funded by, you know, myself. And how much does it cost uh, to hire an industrial designer? The, the initial designer that I worked with, so it was more of like an hourly uh, kind of thing. It mm-hmm. was it was project based at first, but then we had like retainers and and, and added stuff. I think I paid yeah. I paid eventually around you know I think ten thousand dollars or something like that. Um, wow! For the eventual design, yeah, yeah. I mean, for I, the design, ten thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Does that scare you to invest uh, this amount of money without knowing if uh, you know you will succeed? I mean, it, it definitely did. I I I definitely took risks on. I, I, like if I were to do this again, obviously I would do many things differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but at the time, you know, I I, I felt like you know I wanted a, a proper design uh, uh, because I really believed in, in the product that I was making. Yeah. Um, and 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 so uh, also uh, one thing to add is, you know, as as I was working with this industrial designer, when I would go to people that I felt would buy something like this. Um, before we had any sketches, the the usual response that I would get was, um, you know, why would I buy something like that? Why don't I just go to IKEA and get a C table? You know, those were the, yeah. the usual responses. Then when we started having some sketches, when you know, when we started working with the industrial designer, I would take those sketches back and talk to talk to those same people, and they would yeah. be like, and, and the response would be like, oh, so you're serious about it? You're you're, you're actually going to do this? Who who would buy something like this, right? And so I continued on, and 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 now we started having like three D rendered designs, and yeah. when I would go back to to the same people now with three D rendered designs, that's when they started showing interest. They're like, "Oh, this is actually not bad." Like what? And they, and then they start asking questions about the actual product. So they're like, "What material are you actually, are you planning on using? What colors are you planning on making? You know, from mm-hmm. from the stable." And so that's you know that was the learning experience for me is like okay i now i know that i would never go to a customer uh, and try to explain an idea and see what they think right because they cannot you have to show it you, yeah. yeah you have to get to the point where you show it you can go to customers and talk to them you know to validate the problem let's say or to see that if they're if they're facing similar issues or they're doing similar things that you are that's fine but to validate a design to validate a product idea you actually you know are asking yeah. too much of people if, if you don't have like a like something visual an mvp you have to show something but yeah. you know i don't know just just by thinking of it you know you you are showing this product to your friends to people and then they say no why would i buy it there's already seat tables and then you still invest you know ten thousand dollars on it even though they were telling that they wouldn't buy it <laughs> like, like, what? What is like? Okay. If it was me, I would be like, okay, I'm not investing in, until I have sure. I'm sure I will. I'll try to make a cheaper design or something. Yeah. Like, what? Uh, what kept you going? Okay, so so there are two two parts to this. Number one is, it it wasn't like you know I went to people they said no and then I invested ten thousand. It was more of like they said no and then I went back and I invested around like. A thousand to two thousand dollars, right. right? To get to get the sketches, and then I and then I would talk to people and see like, okay, they they're it's still a no, but, but it's, it's a maybe now. It's but, kind but, of getting, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a hard no. So I would go back and invest a bit. So the ten thousand dollars, which is a very rough estimate, was was how much I paid over the entire course of my work with this person. But gotcha. the other, but mm-hmm. but so the other thing is, uh, and maybe this this served me is that I'm a stubborn person. Right. Yeah. So, so when someone tells me no, they don't want this. I'm like, you will want this. Trust <laughs> me. Right. <laughs> so, I, I don't know that this is entrepreneurial advice, but this is this is the way I, I am. I, I think definitely it is an entrepreneurial advice. I think persistency <laughs> is key. Yeah. Like that, if there's something I've been learning is consistency and persistency is probably one of the you know most important skills yeah. of an entrepreneur. Yeah. But so but so th- what I, what I would suggest to people and the, and the advice I would pass on is uh you know when people said no to my design it it it, it was a no because they cannot visualize it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh because you know some of those people that actually said no 
now own that table now are using that table yeah. right uh, maybe not that that design that uh, initial design but they did eventually buy something like this right yeah. and and so the the advice that i would pass on is um you know validate the your understanding of the problem and how people are currently uh working around that problem are are their habits aligned with you know what what is happening with you right and and if that's the case then that's your like gauge of okay that means that to an extent there is something there there is an opportunity yeah. there and and that would go further is to like if people you know paid or tried to hack their own solutions if people put an effort to try to solve that problem that's definitely a good indicator that there might be some demand there for yeah. a solu- for a yeah, solution yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. uh because if someone is hacking you know and and you know, taping on their specific solution. That means they haven't found something in the market yeah, that they that wanted, they mm-hmm. right? And 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 so that's you know what what would push you like okay. At, at the end of the day, it's still risk, right? But it's like an educated guess now. Yeah, you're like okay, and, I'm willing to invest. And uh, I, I think you're right. We we should always bring an MVP, something that people could actually visualize. But it I think it it, it feels that for me it was also very important for you to iterate on the designs. Because you learned it, so you you invested a thousand bucks or whatever. You showed to them, and they said like, ah, "I still wouldn't buy it because of this." And then you iterate that. So it was also an iterative process, right? And if you would have maybe invested the 10 k right away without even showing to the users, maybe you would you would build a product that they wouldn't like, right? Yeah, yeah, most definitely, most definitely. And and one thing that you know, I was um, I was lucky enough for is that. I'm my own customer, right? Because I was I was building yeah. something that I myself wanted, right? And, and and so at every point during the development of of one base, I would I would go back and ask myself like, okay, this is what the design looks like today, or, you know, at the time when we were developing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Would I buy something like this? And if the answer was no, okay, then then I would go back and I'm like, okay, it's not good enough. We need to change yeah. something, right? And 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 like for example this this even trickled down to pricing right so the price for one base right now is is around like 180 to 190 dollars right mm-hmm. and 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 so when i decided on the pricing i was like okay how much would i pay for something like this right because yeah. again i i'm i'm a customer definitely i did definitely go back to the market and see what the you know what the market landscape was um and 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 that helped me like pinpoint a price, but at the same time I asked myself like, is this a price that I would pay, right? Mm-hmm. And, and and try to be as honest as possible with myself. Yeah. And 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 that's how I decided on you know the hundred eighty to hundred ninety dollars. But but you know I I, I totally agree with you. Being uh, the first client of your own product is helps a lot. But at some point, at least from my experience, you you get too much too close. To the product you know i've sometimes i it for me it's obvious that certain things work and i, I become kind of biased somehow because you you want your product to work so much right you you want your table to work so much that uh, that you start ignoring little details that might be deal breakers to other people right or it, 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 is this like something that happened to you or were you able to to keep a critical mind for sure for sure so this this is kind of like you know the the decision making or the trade offs you know i always say that like the what eventually becomes part of the design is a result of trade offs so i'll give you an example um this is a this is a product that solves my own problems but i mm-hmm. myself do not use an ipad right i myself right. do not do not watch like netflix on an ipad but when right. i talk to people you know to understand their habits and how they go about you know chilling in their living room relaxing lounging around yeah. many many people did actually mention that they do use an ipad and so today a part of the design is a slot lining the back of one base where you can put an ipad right yeah if cool, if i yeah. were designing if i were designing just for myself i would have not included that in the design but it's because like okay i'm designing for myself but at the same time i'm also designing for the people like myself so the problem we're solving is not specific to me but it's specific to people like me yeah. right and so that's why eventually we decided okay i do not lounge around with an ipad in hand but many people do so this needs to be part of the design but so well, yeah and, and, and in contrast like i'll give you another example one of the main um like uh, responses we got from customers is you have to make this table height adjustable, 
you mm. have to make it height adjustable, right? And so, yeah. because people would say, well, maybe it's too high for my couch, or maybe it's too low for my couch, or 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 you know, I have you know American style furniture where the couches are a bit higher. Versus, you know, someone mm-hmm. else that would say, I have European style couches, which are a little lower to, to, to the ground. So why not make it height adjustable? And that's definitely something that, you know, we went back and forth uh, on a lot, mm-hmm. myself and the industrial designer. But so here's how we eventually decided on on the, uh, you know, on not including it. So today, one base is not height adjustable. And the reason it's not height adjustable is due to two things. Number one is, you know, there's there's a, a a standard, ergonomic standard that industrial designers, furniture designers follow, where, you know, the height of a side table needs to be between 57 to 65 centimeters high. You know, okay. that's that's like the 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 standard for, you know, ergonomic use of a side table. Right. And and. That was part of why we decided, you know, we're going to go uh, with a 63 centimeter height for, for one base. But at the same time, the other aspect is when we were studying the, the market and how people valued different pieces of furniture, what we noticed is the more something is modular, so the more you can adjust heights and move things around and collapse a table and stow it away and things like that, the less value people attributed to it. Which was very, which was very interesting, right? Because if you why, think, why is that? Th- I have no idea. This is this is this, this is just the way things are. And, you know, if you if you think about it, you know, very high end furniture, and it's not to say that we're attempting to be a very high end furniture, but very high end, you know, tables are never yeah. are never height adjustable. True, right? They they are, you know, here's because it's seen like, as an art piece. So you know, yeah. the artist gotcha. the, the artist made this. The user should not come and interfere with how the artist wants yeah. this piece of art to look like, right? Or yeah. or to be or to function, right? And so I think that's maybe where the the idea of you know if it's height adjustable and things like that, yeah, okay, maybe it's a bit more functional, but at the same time, yeah. it, it, its value will decrease. The subconscious value will decrease. So what we noticed was many people wanted not just height adjustment, but also for the table to collapse. Why? Yeah. Because they wanted to stow it away. They wanted to put it away. Yeah. Okay. And so understanding that, we took it one step further. They wanted to stow it away because as we've mentioned, sometimes those pieces of furniture look ugly. So they don't yeah. want it to stay there. And so what we've done was we, we, we challenged the industrial designer to be like, okay, we're not going to make it collapsible, but we want to make it A, have a functionality when it's not being in use and B, to be like a piece of art that you do not want to put away. And how did you manage this this community of of uh, users that were giving you this feedback? Did, did you like like create a Twitter account or LinkedIn? How did you like iterate and speak with them through the process of building the 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 table? Uh, uh, I mean, it was it was never something very uh, structured. Uh, it was more or less just talking to people. And based on how people responded to me, I, I made an, an like an assessment or a judgment of, yeah, does this person sound like the yeah. person that would buy something like that? Or is, does this person sound like part of my target market or not? But right? how, how would you speak with them? Like what's up? How would you even find them? Okay, good, good question. So some of them are actually like uh, first degree friends. So they're, they're my immediate friends. Yeah. Um, but, but at the same time, what I found to be most effective are friends of friends, because sometimes your immediate friends, um, might be biased or yeah. might, might want to tell you what you want to hear, but friends of friends, um, are like, okay, maybe you, you know, this person, but you know, you only see them on, uh, you know, once a year or, you know, you see them when you play football, they're just friends of friends. Right. Um, and I would talk to these people either on the phone or or meet up in, in person uh, and just try to be aware of, you know, their changes of, in tone, their body language, the way they responded to, like, me yeah. talking to them. So it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to interview you because I'm doing this, uh, this, this project. No, it was more like I'm just trying to understand, you know, uh, how you lounge around in your apartment. Uh, do you watch Netflix? Do you, and, and, yeah. and just, you know, just discuss things, talk, talk through it, right? But how would this conversation look like? So you would uh, maybe you're playing football and you'd be like, ah, by the way, I'm also building this table. 
Uh, can I get your opinion? Is that how it would look like? Yeah, yeah. That that's uh, that's actually like w like one of the one of the ways. I definitely did not, you know, think of you know, hey, I want to book you at this time slot so we can sit down and discuss this because I wanted to talk about a, a table that I'm developing. It was more yeah. of you know, uh, we're done playing football. You know, you're you're you know, you spend like 10, 15 minutes on the sidelines, like stretching once once you're done. Uh, and you know, I know this friend of a friend, like maybe just recently got married or something like that and i feel like okay maybe this person is part of my target market so just you know chat with this person like oh hey the, the, uh, how is living you know uh, mm. in your apartment uh, like in which area are you are you living oh what's that like like is it is, is it is that a tiny apartment or yeah. oh, no that's a, yeah, and and that's like that's you know how i get that's my foot in the door yeah <laughs> did you ever feel that the people might think that you're being a bit you know annoying with this like always speaking <laughs> about your table <laughs> yeah yeah definitely definitely i mean definitely my my immediate friends uh got sick of just hearing about yes, the table I can because, imagine, yeah. yeah because four because, years <laughs> yeah exactly exactly it's because it took four years and 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 definitely some of my friends started mocking me about it like wow yeah. it, it takes you four years to make a table what a good engineer like okay because, <laughs> because the background's an engineer, an engineer. but yeah, 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 yeah. So, so definitely some mocking along the way <laughs> but that you ignore that right it didn't kept you down yeah yeah definitely definitely yeah. you just you just feel like because at, you know throughout these four years the reason i feel like a huge part of why i kept going was because you know i kept on thinking like should i just stop this project like should i just abandon it but mm -hmm. then i think like i still want this though like i still want this yeah, table to exist needed, i yeah. i need it you finished your design you're happy with it what what is the next step then is to start building it right so 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 just right before that is you know after spending ten thousand dollars with the first industrial designer we realized that you know this is a good design but it's not a design for what we wanted which was you know ultimately being flat packed so mm -hmm. so we actually scrapped that entire design and i and i and oh. i found a completely different uh designer when when i when i looked for that you know, second designer that I wanted to work with, uh, I took it upon myself to vet this designer, right? Meaning that, okay, this is not just an industrial designer that does furniture, but this is also an industrial designer that has done flat packed furniture before. So the designer yeah. already tells you like what material to use, or is that only the manufacturer that decides? The designer definitely does, uh, you know, make recommendations on the materials. Uh, but there is still, you know, a bit of back and forth. So when you go to your manufacturer, they they might suggest like, okay, uh, you're suggesting that we uh, weld the screw onto the onto the table. I would suggest why not weld it from the other side and put the threads on the on the table. Like they would make recommendations and and if, like for ease of manufacturing or for better manufacturing, let's say. Yeah. And so these recommendations. They would be like CC'd in the email loop with the uh, industrial designer, and then the industrial yeah. designer looks at it and ultimately makes the decision. So at this point, you are you are paying both the manufacturer and the designer, right? Uh, at, at the time, I had already paid the designer, but now when we're working with the manufacturer uh, for one base for the tray table, we did not go directly to the uh, factories. We went through a middleman. Uh, which mm. is like uh, called a manufacturing manager or a manufacturing license. Uh, so, right. th so this this agency acts as like a middleman uh, that is, let's say, based in in China. So if you're, you know, producing your product in China, they would be a, ma uh, a manufacturing manager based in China that would represent you as as the, as a client, right? And all of this process was remote, right? Or you never met with them in person up until now, up until that point. I've met with the with the uh, designer, the industrial designer. Uh, okay. I have met with them. Uh, so you flew to Korea? No, they, to meet with them. they actually flew into to Kuwait. We had them wow. fly, into, fly into Kuwait. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when uh, they made a, they made a prototype, right? Mm -hmm. And they brought the prototype and came to Kuwait with the prototype. So you finally then, I guess, uh, found a factory that was able to build the product the way you wanted. And um, how many units did you build first? So th this was definitely a, a challenge that we faced. Um, no manufacturer was willing to, you know, build a low quantity for us. So we, we wanted, you know, lower risk. We wanted to, like, make maybe 100 pieces and test the market. Um mm -hmm. 
but none of the factories, like our manufacturing manager tried very hard to find uh, a manufacturer that would produce just 100 pieces. Um, but the challenge is, you know, for a manufacturer, like they're going to make an entire assembly line and, and assign a lot of resources because your product is completely custom made, right? And for them to be, for, for, it, for your project to be worth it, they need to manufacture at least 500 pieces. Okay, what do I do now, right? <laughs> You, you've paid so much, right? You paid two industrial designers now. Uh, you spent so much. Like at this point, we've already like spent maybe two, two and a half years uh, working on this project. And you're yeah. like, like, what do I do now? <laughs> like, like it's a huge risk, but you know, I've already invested so much time and effort and money into this. Like, do I just cancel this project? Um, and it was definitely a tough, tough decision. Maybe one of the toughest decisions that I had to make so far in, in this project. Did uh, you take it alone? Did you speak with your wife? Did you get some uh, mentorship? Def- definitely alone. Uh, I, I took a loan. I said, "Okay, you know, we got." And 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 here's the here's the interesting thing. Like, I wanna I wanna circle back to like the day job. I'm definitely thankful that I had the day job because otherwise yeah. I wouldn't be able to fund this project. Like, no way would a bank be able yeah. to loan me the money if I didn't have like a salary to be like, okay, like I would be able to, to pay back this, this money. So, so you produces this 500 pieces and, uh, I don't know if you can uh, disclose that, but like what, what is more or less the price? Yeah. So, so, so the entire project, the entire startup cost for the entire project, including all design, all manufacturing, um, shipping, everything to, to Kuwait, like just to get started, Cost about a hundred k, yeah, hundred k. Which, which is, a, I think, it's an okay price uh, for, uh, you know, of course that for a, an individual to to pay this is is a lot. But if you think on a big company, a big corporation, maybe IKEA, you know, I mean, IKEA would pay that in a blink of an eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for, <laughs> you know? for sure, for sure, definitely. For myself, it was you know the opportunity cost, right? At the at the time, I had you know. Uh, you know, spent four years working on this, uh, working on this project. My previous project, which was the laundry business, kind of failed, uh, mm-hmm. never, never went anywhere. Um, and I thought to myself, like, you know, opportunities, you know, like this, you, you know, it may come and go, but, you know, you have an opportunity in front of you. Right. Yeah. And, and you want to do something. Um, and, and ultimately, like I mentioned, um, you know, I'm thankful that I had the funding for this for this project, you know, as a bank loan and the, the, the bank did take an interest, of course. But at the end of the day, I was like, OK, I want to do this. Right. Yeah. Uh, if, if I don't do this, you know, maybe I'll, I'll you know, I'll move on and everything will be fine. But I'll come back and think. What what would have happened had I pulled the trigger and started yeah, this business, yeah, right? I, I hear this a lot from other entrepreneurs that, uh, you know, they cannot live with the doubt of uh, what if, you know? So it, that's kind of the trigger then to to go for it. It's exactly. Uh, interesting. Uh, exactly. How did it feel to get the first product <laughs> shipped to your house <laughs> oh wow i mean i mean at, uh, okay so 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 and i would cry you know i would cry <laughs> seeing that <laughs> yeah that 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 was that was you know there are there were moments like without being too cheesy there were moments that felt surreal like they it felt like whoa like yeah wow we, we're, we're actually at this point and and some of those aspects were you know uh, before actually selling uh we we faced a lot of issues trying to bring the shipment of 500 pieces to Kuwait. Um, the first the first shipping company that I worked with, they took about two to three months, and they still w- didn't figure out how to move this shipment. And so at the time, I was thinking oh. like, wow, could could it possibly be that you know the the 500 pieces actually don't exist? Like, could hmm. could it be that the, that the, the products don't exist and I've been scammed? You wow. know, like, is is it possible? I mean, I, I got some pictures, you know, from the factory, um, mm-hmm. and and they did show like my product, but at the same time, you're thinking, well, well, maybe they made like five pieces. Wow. Okay, maybe I'm I'm being scammed. Like, maybe the 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 product actually does not exist, and I've wasted four years and hundred k on on nothing. And so there was a huge like sigh of relief when i moved to an another shipping company and and that shipping company was able to 
ship the products within a couple mm-hmm. of weeks. And, and, and that's when I realized, you know, the first shipping company that I worked with actually didn't know what they were doing. But yeah, we shipped the products. They came, they came into Kuwait and, and we sent them directly to like the warehouse where we were planning on, uh, fulfilling from. And so when these products came in, when they came into Kuwait and, and, you know, they went to the warehouse, the first, uh, thing they would do is, you know, they would inspect the shipment that came in. Right. And, and, right. and so I remember having the, like the, the phone number of the, of the guy that was in charge of like the warehousing in Kuwait. And I was making my way to the warehouse, but at the same time, I was calling this guy. I was like, you know, did, did you open some of the packages? Like, <laughs> are, are, are the packages okay? Is everything okay? Because in my mind, I was thinking, you know, I'm preparing myself for the worst case scenario. I'm yeah, preparing yeah, myself, yeah. you know, that the entire 500 pieces were damaged. I don't know why. I'm, I'm not being negative, but, but, you know, for everything that happened leading up to this point, I'm thinking worst case scenario. And, and he's on the phone. He's like, calm down, calm down. Your shipment is here. Uh, we are starting to open them, but from the outside, everything looks to be okay. Nothing seems to be dented or, you know, the, 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 the outside packaging, nothing seems to be like, um, you know, damaged or anything. Yeah, but, yeah. So, so no worries. Just come. We're starting to open and everything seems to be fine. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and I'm like driving there. And, and yeah, that, that first moment of, you know, Arriving at the warehouse where I found, you know, a couple of the the workers there were uh, had, you know, a few of the boxes open, inspecting, barcode labeling, and they seemed to be very calm. And for me, on, on the other side, I'm like, okay, 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 those are our products? Okay, okay, wow, okay. But yeah, and, and your, the rest of your boxes are here, like, okay, okay, okay. And, and this was like one of those moments where I'm like, okay. We're in business. We're ready for customers now. Wow! So, so that was a huge. You know, it's it's, yeah. it's hard. You know, it's hard to to imagine for me that all of this journey was still without having any any sell. You know, like you had such a huge journey, such a big challenge, just to now actually start selling. And uh, so, so that's now my question is: How did you sell it? Like, did you build like an online store? Did you go to stores like? How did it go? So, 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 um, one thing that I attempted to do was I attempted to do pre sales, so pre orders, mm. um, because we had the samples that were sent from the, uh, from the manufacturer. And, uh, one of the last samples that we received were what's called production samples. Um, mm-hmm. and so they are samples of exactly what the production, you know, units are going to look like. This is the quality you will be receiving for all 500 pieces. So this is the very last sample that you approve on so that they would start manufacturing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that sample that I had, I did a photo shoot for and I set up a, a website and, and we started getting some pre-orders. Wasn't anything crazy. We got about, I think, 14 to 17 pre-orders. That's it. Um, but to me, how I'm did like, you advertise this website? Uh, absolutely no advertising. I, I was completely <laughs> new and naive to this. Um, I set up an Instagram page. Uh, mm-hmm. just, just, and, and I mean, 14 to 17 orders of 17 tables sold. I think maybe 10 of them were just like immediate family, just being supportive. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but, 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 and, and that's, again, that's one of those moments is the first order pre-order that came in from someone that I didn't know. Like, I didn't know who that person was. Yes, and I, yeah, I remember, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember this person clearly, like, I'm like, this is a real customer. Like, no offense, <laughs> no offense to my immediate family and friends, but this is a real customer. Like this is a customer that isn't buying because I made this. They're buying this because they want this, right? Uh, and I have no idea how they eventually landed on 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 you know my page. I think it's you know just family and friends that you know liked my the photos that were on Instagram and yeah, this person yeah. saw it from an explore page or a share or something. I don't know, but. <laughs> But we got our first like real pre-order, and that, yeah, that was yeah, definitely yeah. a huge moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those I, I I completely understand that when uh, when you reach the network outside of your network, eh? when you reach people outside of your network, you feel, you know, now it can actually start growing uh, because there's people that don't know me, don't have you know any connection with me, and they are actually buying my product, so th- it must be good, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and at the same time, because you know the people, especially the people that pre-ordered that you do not know, like you're you've written there, you know, you're gonna be waiting a couple of months till you actually receive your product. So this yeah. person must like really want this thing to exactly, to, to want yeah, to wait yeah. two months. So uh, they were huge. It it was huge. Yeah. 
what was the date when you got the the shipment of the 500 uh, pieces so yeah so we got this shipment uh mid april of this year 2021 mid april yeah. and uh, okay so now you you can start selling like how did you how many pieces did you sell so far so so now we've just passed uh 200 230 pieces i think we just passed 230 yeah is it already profitable so did you already pay your loan with this 230 oh uh, no 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 for sure not uh, still not. a lo st still a long way to go to like break even on the initial investment so far you're only using instagram to to showcase and to, and to get new customers or are you trying also other social networks ads How, how is that going? We're only going to be on, on Instagram for now. Uh, we're only okay. selling through our own website for now. And uh, is it you that is managing those channels or uh, who is managing your uh, social media? Yeah, myself, uh, myself uh, right now. I'm managing everything. Right now, yeah. we're, I'm, like, I'm still at the point of, you know, I, I still want to continue understanding my customer, continue understanding my business and where I want to take it. But, you know, in, in my experience... Uh, and you are also an engineer. I'm a software engineer. Marketing is it's the hardest part, you know, of the job. And uh, especially when I start doing ads, I, I feel that all my money just disappears, and I don't I don't understand where the money is going. I just you know, <laughs> yeah, they say yeah, like, I'm okay, sure. you just spent 50 euros, you spent 100 euros, and okay, where where are the results? You know, yeah, uh, is yeah. that the same for you? So one thing that that I've done uh, and I've learned is that. Uh, the Instagram algorithm, when you're doing paid ads, uh, when you click on automatic, so, you know, when you set, you know, who you want to target and you just leave it at mm -hmm. automatic, what Instagram is doing or what Facebook is doing is it's looking for people within 1% similarity of your current followers. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so, so what it's doing is it's looking at the current followers of this page and, and saying, okay, It's going to go out and look for people that are within 99% similarity to the people that are currently following this product. Mm -hmm. And so and so when I realized that, what I started doing was, you know, I would go to influencers, you know, and again, this is paid, but very, very niche influencers here in Kuwait that I felt, um, you know, uh, appealed to to our target market and the people we wanted yeah. to target i did some 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 you know paid uh, influencer marketing and i i got about let's say 500 a thousand followers on on instagram but so those were people that were like my market and then i started doing um you know instagram ads because yes. now mm -hmm. now the now the algorithm would know what type of people to to look for right and to promote my post to right right um, yeah And um, when you say you you did some paid influence in marketing, what is that? Uh, so it's it's simply like looking for people that are influential uh, here in Kuwait uh, mm -hmm. within within uh, you Your know the category uh, yeah and, and and my target group and it's simply you know approaching them being like hey we have this product we're we're just starting out we're a small business we'd love to send you uh, a table uh, to know more about your uh, you know your thoughts and and what you think about it and possibly you know uh, having you you know share it with your either followers because we believe that they might find it useful now some of the mm -hmm. people that would re respond to you will be like hey you know thank you for uh, reaching out uh, we'd absolutely love to to support you uh your product looks great yada 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 uh, you can go ahead and send us a sample and you know they'd give you their uh, address and details and you just send send the product and basically mm -hmm. what that means is they do it for for free it's just you know just send us a table right other other uh, accounts are more like uh, okay hey th these are my rates uh or sometimes it's even like uh, someone that's managing this influencer's account so be like yeah. okay hey i'm the account manager for uh, this person um the rates are as follows um would you like like a detailed coverage would you like a, a simple coverage would you like a post and and stories you know you just negotiate basically what yeah. the sort of coverage would be like because I, i've heard and with the interviews i had with the people that also selling uh, material things so like clothes and so on they told me that reaching out to influencers is definitely the best or what worked best for them uh but you still decided to go to ads to use ads right uh is it performing better than uh, just you know reaching out to influencers and asking them to share your product i mean i can't outright say like 
influencer uh, ads are outperforming like paid Instagram ads. Um, it's it's more of you know how the specific influencer performs or how their how their uh, coverage performs. So mm-hmm. we've definitely had you know. Uh, you know, we, for example, one of the influencers we've uh, we've paid, um, their coverage was, you know, more or less. Here's a table; it's available in three colors. Here's their here's their uh, tag, and and obviously this right. this sort of coverage performed really poorly. Um, versus, you know, a different uh, influencer that actually put in the effort. They explained the entire product. They showed how they were using the the. Uh, uh, the table, um, they, you know, sh- uh, showed how it assembles easily, all of that stuff. And then, you know, a week later, they would show again how they continue are continually using it. And so that, that sort of ad where the influencer is, uh, you know, more thorough in their explanation, uh, obviously performs much better. Um, mm-hmm. At the same time, you know, paid Instagram ads, we've had some ads that performed tremendously, amazing okay. performance. Some ads performed uh, much worse, but so the metric that I'm always, you know, keeping in mind is um, return on ad spend ROAS, um, yeah. and so what that means is, you know, for every one dollar that I've paid, how much am I getting back? Right? How many? How many? How many times of that dollar am I getting mm-hmm. back? And how is it now at the moment? For uh, influencers, we've gone uh, anywhere from like 0.5 to around six to seven. Um, and, and usually the rule of thumb is, you know, anything above four is decent, like is, is solid, right? You you point five, so one one order costs you only point five cent uh, dollars. Let's say this this influencer cost me three hundred sixty dollars, mm-hmm. okay? Um, and when 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 that influencer uh, did their coverage and did made their ad, uh, we only got one sale. And so one sale mm-hmm. is one hundred eighty dollars. What that yeah. means is I spent three hundred and sixty, but I only right. got one hundred eighty back, right? Yeah. So that means that my return on ad spent is just point five. So so that's the the metric that uh, I I follow. And so far, you 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 have gotten four a return of four times the your invest. Um, some influencers I uh, I got you know as high as five and six. Uh, wow. uh, X, yeah, which which are which are very solid uh, numbers, uh, but uh, uh, others I've gotten, you know, something like 0. 0.5, 2, 1. So mm-hmm. it, it, there there are many variables that affect this. And at the same time, yeah. with with Instagram ads, I've also gotten, you know, anywhere from one and two to around six and seven uh, with Instagram ads. Were you expecting somehow to have more orders? Because, you know, it, for me, it's very hard for me to lower my expectations. So every time I'm building a new feature, in, in my <laughs> case, for my app, I think, okay, this will be huge, you know? Yeah. Uh, was it the same for you? They thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to sell all of them in the heartbeat or uh, or, you, or not? Um, I mean, I definitely did not expect, you know, six months in to have sold around 250 like not in my wildest dreams. I did not expect wow. this. Like okay. I, I expected to sell some, but but not not at this pace. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely not at this pace. Um, so right now we're we're averaging about one table sold per day. That's like our wow. our our average, um, yeah. and, and that's our uh, that's my the benchmark that I've set my for myself. So my monthly target is to sell thirty tables. One per day. Uh, anytime that we sell more per month, that means we've beat our tar- beaten our target. Anytime that we haven't, I reassess like why didn't we meet this uh, this target? Um, mm-hmm. But so definitely, I did not expect to sell this many at this rate, um, which I'm very thankful for for sure. Yeah, that's amazing. And how did you get featured by Hindi Acres? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The, uh, all of uh, you know, uh, because of the time zone difference. Uh, yeah. I wake I wake up one day and I have a Twitter uh, DM, uh, and the Twitter DM is from Indie Hackers. And like I've heard of Indie Hackers, and I know like it's a, it's a popular uh, let's say uh, community, and, mm-hmm. and 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 it's Indie Hackers, and they've sent me a message. They're like, uh, hey, we love the, uh, uh, your product and the way you're sharing your journey on Twitter. Uh, we would love it if you would do an, an AMA. And and this is me like reading the Twitter DM as soon as I woke up. So I'm like, I'm squinting yeah. and I'm trying to open my eyes. I'm like, is this really the <laughs> hackers? Like, it, it, it felt like a big deal. And then it, it was like very interesting. Did it bring a lot of uh, 
you know, orders and people interested or not so much? I mean, n- n- not so much. We, we didn't get mm-hmm. any orders, uh, mainly because, you know, Indie Hackers is not particularly, you know, popular in Kuwait, let's say. Um, mm. We got a lot of traffic from, from obviously the US, Europe, because I think that's, that's, you know, the major demographic represented in Indie Hackers uh, are people there. But, but right now we do not, um, like ship outside of the GCC. Yeah. It's funny. I was just now opening uh, Indie Hackers uh, page on Twitter and they blocked me. <laughs> Oh wow! wow. <laughs> You're blocked. You can follow and see why. Why not? <laughs> did I did I spam them too much? Maybe I spam them. Oh, I put... <laughs> oh maybe. <laughs> Funny. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but, um. Yeah, I mean that that happens a lot to me. No <laughs> Uh Yo, this is a this is a great story. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing it with uh, one of the entrepreneur community. What are your uh, next steps? Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. I mean, I mean, this is this is great. You know, anytime that I I get to share my story and and you know have a conversation like this, uh, it's always enjoyable, always fun. Um, yeah, same for me. I mean, for 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 myself, uh, moving forward, uh, you know, when this when this project started, the idea was, you know, I wanted to build a product that solved my own problem. Uh, fast forward to today, and you know. Uh, beyond thankful uh, and overwhelmed with the with the response, uh, and as we've started slowly, you know, interacting with our customers, engaging with them. Now we're at the point mm-hmm. where, you know, I want to develop to develop this as a brand that stands for more than just a table. I'm not going to say that you know from day one we had this grand vision, but it was it's, it's slowly a vision that's starting to take shape, and so. The, the intention is to take this brand in the direction of, you know, we want a brand that stands for downtime. We want, we want to create products that help people slow down, take time mm-hmm. off and just relax, chill, relax, yeah. lounge around yeah, their, yeah. their apartment. And so how can we create products or how can we design products that intentionally promote people to slow down? Right. Um, and so that's the overarching brand. Uh, identity that we want to stand for. Okay. Yeah. So actually, as we speak, uh, we're currently developing our second product, um, which is a weighted blanket. I don't know, even know what is that. It's like a, a blanket, like a heavy blanket or something. What, yeah. What is that? So, so so it's an intentionally uh, weighted blanket, like he- a heavy blanket. If you if you Google okay. it, if you Google weighted blanket, uh, you, you know you'll you'll uh, learn more yeah. on, about the concept. Uh, but so the idea is. You know, you, you put on a weighted blanket that's around 10% of your body weight. So if you're, let's say, 80 kilograms, you would buy a weighted blanket that's weighted around 8 kilograms. And so you know, that would be like a heavy blanket, but you would put it on you and, and it has been proven to like lower your stress levels, like literally lower your stress levels, calm you down, okay, r- 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 relax you, right? Which is absolutely amazing, right? Yeah, I mean, it's um, I can really hear the passion also that you have for your brand, for your products, for entrepreneurship. And I think, you know, you can really transpire that when you speak. And that's, uh, I always, you know, love to speak with people that have this, uh, you know, passion for uh, for their products and for their company. And uh, I really believe that a lot of people uh, that are listening to this will learn a lot uh, from you. Uh, Abdul Musin, so thank you so much, and um, also I will share your your product, your website, your Instagram, everything you want on, you want me to share on the description of this podcast, and uh, hopefully it will also generate uh, some orders. I will also, by the way, in, invite Abdul Musin to join our wannabe entrepreneur Slack community. Is a community a Slack community with. Uh, where most of the people I interview hang out and it's cool because there's already entrepreneurs from, uh, you know, different walks of life. There's even one entrepreneur that has a fulfillment center in the U S might be even a good connection. Oh, nice. And, uh, <laughs> yes. and um, yeah, all your uh, contacts and website will be in the description. And uh, if uh, it's, you're a first time listener, Make sure to check all the interviews with all the other entrepreneurs. I think you will find it very interesting. This was another wannabe entrepreneur. See you tomorrow.